excited to talk about the October fiduciary update. There's a lot going on. Um, pretty exciting stuff on the legislative front um, with the Build Back Better proposal. And um, the month of October marks the coming of the new uh, 401k and IRS limits for contributions and all sorts of great things for 2022. We're eagerly awaiting that. We have some predictions there. And then uh, some updates on some cases. Uh, there's been a lot of I think good movement in the litigation space to help sponsors sort of think about how they are preparing to potentially defend themselves in any of these uh, excessive fee suits or any of these um, litigation claims brought against investment funds. We're also going to take a look at a, a survey uh, regarding the what's what's being termed the great resignation. And then we're going to take a deep dive into retirement income and uh, what that means for plans. Let's start off with the quick hits. Give us, uh, give us what's and some insight of what's going on with the Build Back Better plan and some of the retirement legislation related to it. Yeah, well, you know, we've been talking throughout the year about our expectation for having legislative change that's going to impact retirement plans. And you know, I think since our last conversation broadly, the focus has really shifted from a lot of the dedicated bills we've been talking about to the budget bills, for better or for worse. Congress has to pass uh, a budget and, you know, it's now becoming less about what Congress wants to do and more about what they need to get done and, and what they can do within the Build Back Better Act. So, um, you know, that bill, as we sit here today in mid-October, um, has been approved by the House Ways and Means Committee, and we should talk about the retirement provisions in there. Still needs full House approval, still needs so full uh, Senate approval. So it's facing a lot of changes, but there's some pretty big items um, that that have made it forward so far. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's a long way from... Uh being law here, but um, there are some big changes in the retirement space. And, you know, I'm not sure if the, how I feel about all of them as we talk <laughs> through them, but, but I think there's a lot of good in here. So let's sort of go through and talk about the, the policy and budgetary changes that are being proposed. Yeah. And I would, I would broadly categorize, you know, there's some things in the bill that are policy items. Um, you know, they have budgetary impact, but it's hard to make a claim that they're doing them for budget purposes. That would include, um, for the first time, a requirement for most companies to sponsor a defined contribution plan. Um, there's no requirement to do that today. That's a really big change. Um, and also even going a step further and requiring that that plan auto enroll workers. So that auto enrollment requirement wouldn't impact existing plans, but definitely kind of puts the pressure on companies that don't use automatic enrollment, recognizing that they're definitely going to be become more and more outliers. Yeah, I think that's an example of one that I feel good, like socially, that's a good thing for people mm -hmm. to, to have them in these plans. But from a revenue perspective, that actually probably hurts the revenue side of the equation. It does. You know, it's expensive to have more tax deferred uh, money that is not being taxed in, in the current day. But really the biggest pushback on it, you know, that we hear, you know, where Republicans are generally less in favor of that provision is concern about impact on small business. Is it just going to be too onerous of a requirement for small companies putting, you know, the, the government revenue element aside, just the cost of, of plans, cost of administration? Yeah, yeah, agreed. What else is in the proposal? You know, the other big, um, I'll say policy item is on required minimum distributions. Those got pushed out in the SECURE Act to age 72. Um, and, you know, there's momentum to push that further to age 75. I've heard Congress, uh, congressional leaders talk about wanting to get rid of the, the traditional RMD altogether. That's really expensive, um, but essentially trying to give more flexibility to workers. You know, there's a fair amount of evidence that there's there's a population of retirees that really cues to RMDs for their distributions um, and wanting to just create more flexibility where perhaps it doesn't exist today. And how would I think about this in terms of revenue generation? This seems to be another way to mm -hmm. delay revenue generation, right? It does, definitely. You know, that's kind of the purpose of RMDs is it forces you to recognize um, some taxable income on these dollars that have been tax deferred and, you know, pushing that out pushes out the recognition of, of those taxes. And so what, in relation to other proposals, um, there's a proposal on sort of 
forcing distributions over certain dollar amounts. So talk about what the proposal is. Yeah, there. that's let's we'll put that in our budget or our bucket of budget items that, um, you know, I'm sure there's a policy reason for it. But, you know, the government also definitely looking to potentially limit some accumulation and plans. Certainly the concept of the mega backdoor Roth in plans has become more and more popular in recent years using after-tax contributions and Roth conversions to be able to both defer up to those 415 limits, the higher limits for contributions, but also, you know, Roth contributions, there's no taxes on those earnings. There's a fairly big um, kind of public splash uh, a few weeks ago now related to Peter Thiel that he's got about $5 billion in a Roth IRA. Um, there's some potentially um, questionable things that went into him accumulating that, but the, the theory behind that is, look, you know, these programs were never intended for people to accumulate a billion dollars in an IRA. And there's been a few other, you know, very well off high um, income, high net worth individuals, you know, Warren Buffett, I believe has $30 million in a Roth IRA, you know, others in the $20 million range. And the government is looking to say, look, you know, this is not what we want and we need money. And that seems to be potentially a place to get it. Right. And those are examples of significant examples of outliers that the reality right. is, I mean, how much does a what is sort of the maximum a person has in their 401k plan or their mm -hmm. IRA or, or combined? It, it's almost impossible unless you're one of those people who gets extremely lucky or who bends the rules a little bit to to get those types of balances. Yeah, we have done some math. Um, so so maybe we'll talk first about the proposal. Um, the proposal fundamentally is to say, it's creating a new type of requirement minimum distribution, where if as of the end of the year, you have an initial uh, starting value or ending value for the year of $10 million in aggregate across your qualified accounts, that's all of your 401k accounts, all of your IRAs, then in the next year, you would have a required distribution of half of that excess. So if I'm Warren Buffett, I've got $30 million, my required minimum distribution would be $10 million, you know, 50% of the value over the $10 million threshold. So to your question, well, how do you get, you know, sitting here today, $10 million in your qualified retirement accounts? You know, it's not imp impossible. Um, you know, if you had deferred up to the limits, um, the core 402G limit, got employer contributions, had pretty strong double digit investment returns, you get pretty close. Um, if you really had strong returns, but those had to be 15 ish percent. If you were in a plan that was designed for the last 35 years to get you all the way up to that 415 limit, you know, 30 to $60,000 in contributions every year, and you had a 10% return, you're sitting right at about $10 million. But to your point, you know, you had to have really high savings every single year and really high, you know, pretty strong investment returns every single year to be hitting that threshold. Yeah, so that that population is mostly it's going to be a small population. So yeah, I'm not sure how much revenue that's really going to generate uh, well, going it's forward. Peter Thiel, it's a few billion. <laughs> <laughs> Just forcing the. I think it's forcing the, 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 the. I think the real issue is it's it's really it's going to impact tax planning for larger estates. Absolutely, and and that's a whole different item. So you know, going after people with large balances to get tax revenue. I think may maybe this would be a good thing. I'm not sure it's going to be a, a, a big thing for 99% of the people in retirement plans. And perhaps that's part of the objective. You know, there's only a handful of people that are going to be impacted, but relative to that impact, potentially right. significant tax revenue. Yeah. Just seems like there'd be other ways to get those people to pay more taxes. But, <laughs> and I digress. Yeah. Well, and uh, I, I think the other thing that's worth noting is there's a few proposals that would kind of introduce a new income-based restriction in plans. Yes. You know, today the use of Roth contributions in plans, the use of Roth conversion is open to anyone regardless of income. Um, and there's a proposal to, to income restrict those. So the income restrictions vary a little bit for married versus single, but around 400, 400 $150,000 per year of taxable income is where those would kick in. So, you know, just, just layering on a little bit to help, I'll say, stem higher earners from over accumulating, at least in the government's point of view. But to your point, 
definitely, you know, making it a little more challenging for those individuals to make their decisions and stay within the guidelines. Right. One of the proposed changes I'm not sure how to think about is the the removal, potentially removal of after tax and the backdoor Roth. So talk a little bit about mm-hmm. that and yeah, why for that sure. Might be something that um, gets passed. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, those are two different things, and we've said for years, people say, you know can this loophole be closed? And the answer has always been yes, but it's going to take legislative action. Um, and, it, you know, it's taken this long for a proposal to even come up, you know, really to close the mega backdoor Roth loophole. Really, the only thing that needs to happen is putting that income restriction on Roth conversions. And somewhat surprisingly, um, the proposal is to pass that, but it's not effective until 2031. So that's the only thing they really need to do to close the loophole. But there's a separate proposal to completely disallow traditional after-tax contributions. And and these are only proposals. I mean, they have been approved by the Ways and Means Committee. But I wouldn't be surprised to see traditional after-tax contributions stick around. There are a few use cases for those besides I'm a high earner trying to tax shelter more money. There's a growing movement to use after tax as a way to promote emergency savings or near term savings in retirement plans. So seems um, very uh, sudden, I'll say, to completely disallow those contributions potentially starting next year. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the provisions I think would impact a lot of our clients because a lot of our clients offer after tax mm-hmm. contributions. Yeah, And again, it, there's a great use case for it besides, you know, the mega backdoor. Well, let's move on to the IRS limits for 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this usually this is kind of a no big deal. You, know, you can <laughs> just expect a, a small or, or um, no increase. But, you know, given what's going on with inflation, I think we might be seeing some differences this year. So why don't you highlight what we expect here? For sure. So um, typically limits are announced in October. The IRS has full discretion to uh, make those annual adjustments. So it kind of goes in the face of our budgetary discussions. But ultimately, you know, they're going to look at inflation. They're going to look at wage growth. And arguably, we've had more of that in the last year than we've had in over a decade. So we can talk through them individually. We can start with the 402G limit. That is the combined total of pre-tax and Roth contributions. Most years, we see either no change or an increase of $500 in that limit. Um, There's been one or two times in the past 30 years where it's increased by more than $500, but we really think that is a probable outcome this year, potentially seeing an increase up to $20,500. Tell us what a participant, how a participant should think about this increase and maybe like what are the percentages of people who Mm -hmm. hit those limits each year? Yeah, great question. You know, it is a minority. I would say in the typical plan we see, it's in the neighborhood of 5 to 10%. Um, definitely variation by industry, by pay levels. You know, I don't think I've, uh, I think the highest plans we've seen, you know, we, we do see really high paid populations. We'll get 50 plus percent of people hitting those limits, but, you know, it's an extra thousand dollars that can go into the plan. It may also potentially increase the amount of matching contribution someone can get, uh, depending on the match formula. You know, somebody being able to defer more may unlock the ability to also get matched on those contributions. So let's move over to the catch-up contributions because, you know, older folks like myself, you know, (laughs) we get to catch up uh, for our retirement contributions. So what might happen there? Yeah, so catch-up doesn't tend to change as frequently as we see changes for pre-tax and Roth, but when they do change, we, we tend to see that increase by $500. Um, it's a newer type of contribution, but ultimately, you know, would not be surprised to see this one increasing as well. That would be a jump up to $7,000. Um, so, you know, that that's our baseline expectation. You know, that's a way that the IRS can reflect some of that wage growth and inflation without that big jump in the core limits. And then let's move to the next chart, which is the 415 limit. But before you describe it, uh, help us understand what the 415 limit is. Yeah. So this is the total annual additions limit. This is the total new benefits going into a defined contribution plan account every year. It includes the 402G limit. So for 2021, it includes the 19500 
It doesn't include ketchup, that's always separate. It doesn't include like a rollover into a plan, a correction, for example, but it's gonna include, include company contributions, match, profit sharing, non-elective contributions, and it's going to include those after-tax contributions. So when we talk about that mega backdoor Roth and people deferring up to the total limits, we're talking about this 415 limit. And, you know, again, we've seen pretty consistently increases of about $1,000 a year. Wouldn't be surprised to see this one bump up by $2,000 this year, get us to an even $60,000. Um, as we think about, you know, how the IRS may be reflecting some of those uh, inflationary pressures. Yeah. What about other limits uh, to consider here? Yeah, the, the other probably most notable limit is the compensation limit, how much compensation can be considered under the plan for 2021. That's $290,000. Mm -hmm. That is almost always um, a, a relative to that 415 limit. So if we see that bump up to $60,000, probably going to see the comp limit go up to $300,000. Again, that's going to impact how much benefit that higher paid individuals can receive under their plans. Um, and then probably the least exciting limit um, would be the definition of highly compensated employees for plans that are defining HCEs based on pay. Right now, that's $130,000. Um, could see that bump up by $5,000, uh, but a more uh, a less notable limit. Let's go to the litigation update. A couple of cases in the news uh, recently decided on that uh, I think are pretty good news for sponsors. Yeah, you know, sometimes I feel like we're always talking about like this new case, this new allegation. Um, but the reality is the vast majority of these cases end up either being settled or actually most commonly dismissed. And so I wanted to talk about a couple of high profile dismissals recently pretty resounding victories for sponsors and quite frankly, kind of a roadmap for fiduciaries. You know, if you're facing an allegation, this is exactly how you defend some of these kinds of claims. You know, the first dismissal we can talk about involves AT&T. Their case focused primarily on record keeping fees. There was an allegation that, you know, their record keeping fees were excessive. You know, the evidence that the plaintiffs, the participants offered was comparing the AT&T plan to some publicly available data they found you know, other plans, fees, what they thought those were. You know, AT&T showed up. They said, first, we've consistently reviewed our record keepers' disclosures. Second, we have regularly have done competitive market evaluations. Specifically, they showed they hired an outside consultant. They went out, they got quotes from other record keepers. They used that data to negotiate with their current record keeper. And maybe most importantly, they had documentation of all of those activities. And the court said, yep, that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing here. Um, you know, I think interestingly here, they didn't do a full RFP. Sometimes, you know, we see suggested in the courts or in some of the settlements, it's like, you got to do an RFP. But, you know, market competitive data is a perfectly reasonable way to ensure that your fees are reasonable. And, and I believe, was this the case, there was a reference to uh, some 401k book of averages or some other data points that... That is one uh, that is cited, cited commonly. Um, I, I can't recall if it was this case specifically, but um, there's been a couple that have cited some data that's publicly available from 401k book of averages that's based on very small plans. AT&T mm -hmm. is obviously a very large plan, um, so isn't exactly holding water uh, in court there. Yeah. So let's. what are some of the other allegations here? Yeah, so you know, the, uh, some of the other most common allegations we see are with respect to investment options. First, that the funds themselves are imprudent investment options. Um, in their claims, the way plaintiffs are typically, you know, alleging that a fund is imprudent is saying you offered fund A, here's another fund, fund B, that had better performance. Um, the courts are pretty consistently finding that to be invalid. You know, fiduciaries are not held to finding the best fund. They are held to selecting prudent investments. Um, and in, in this recent dismissal in particular, it was for Common Spirit Health, which is one of the largest healthcare systems nationally. Um, the, the court fundamentally said, look, you know, they were evaluating the fund versus broad benchmarks and broad peer groups. Mm -hmm. And that is a very solid method to determine that an investment is prudent. And just because there's some other fund out there that performed better and or had lower fees, that doesn't mean anything for the fund offered in the plan. Yeah, it's a, it's a common thing. It, it seems to me like the, the 
legal system is getting smarter about how to evaluate and how to build a framework for evaluating these cases. And hopefully that'll result in fewer cases in the future for these types of allegations, because it is expensive to defend yourself from these allegations. That's absolutely right. And unfortunately, you know, these dismissals um, don't necessarily stem the tide of litigation, you know, I'm sure AT&T and Common Spirit would have rather not gone to court to defend their processes. We're hopeful that the Supreme Court case we've talked about with Northwestern is going to help on that front, setting a very clear standard for, you know, what evidence is needed to allege a fiduciary breach. We have heard anecdotally that some courts have kind of put cases on hold, you know, waiting for that Supreme Court standard so they can apply it. Um, but we do seem to be seeing, you know, more courts like these courts that are referencing to some of the case law that's been established with other plans that have faced these same claims. Great. And uh, there was another allegation here, I think. Yeah, you know, we didn't talk specifically about the imprudent investment expenses, but that's another one, you know, alleging that the fees of an actively managed fund are imprudent or they're excessive by comparing them to an index fund. Um, we're seeing courts, again, pretty consistently saying actively managed strategies and index-based strategies are fundamentally not comparable. Mm -hmm. um, and that therefore that's an invalid claim. You know, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting about this common spirit case, the judge and I either very sharp or got good information kind of noted, you know, that, that the plaintiffs um, who brought the case kind of cherry picked time periods and that if they looked at different time periods, their comparisons didn't hold up, but actually went so far as to say, even if you'd brought valid evidence, you still wouldn't have a case here because, you know, you can't use an index fund as a benchmark for fee reasonableness. Yeah, I thought that was a great, uh, great result from that case also. Let's move on to the survey of the month which uh, looked at um, what's being termed the great resignation. I, I mean, maybe just start off with what, what they mean by the great resignation. Yeah, so we're hearing, um, you know, generally discussion of uptick and really two trends, one of them being increased retirements. More people are, are retiring. You know, one of the theories being their 401k balances have done really well in the last year and a half. So, you know, they're hanging it up. Um, but maybe more different, allegedly, is this idea of the great resignation and people that are leaving their current jobs without a new job simply because they think something better is out there. So let's dig into the survey results here. What did uh, the survey, who did the survey look at and what were the key results here? Yeah, so this was a survey from the Plan Sponsor Council of America. They do regular kind of check-ins with sponsors. And this one specifically was asking plan sponsors, you know, what has your experience been? Are you experiencing these trends? And only 30% of the respondents said they feel like retirements really have accelerated. Um, anecdotally, a greater kind of portion of the respondents, you know, commented on increase in turnover, about 60% cited they'd seen turnover increasing um, among younger employees, but not a lot of widespread support for this, you know, kind of idea that we've got this massive wave of change happening the way that I think some of the media would like to portray it. Based on these results, what, what's, what sort of what does the research say in terms of how sponsors should be thinking about this? Yeah, so, you know, we've done our own research. You know, we always want to go and look at the data. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is a great resource for, you know, what's really happening in the numbers. And a couple of highlights there of what we've actually seen in the data, you know, for folks that are age 55 or older, you know, we've, we've seen the labor force participation rate drop a little bit. You know, that's the percentage of people in that age group that are actually looking for a job or working, um, but certainly not a precipitous decline. And, and there's always some volatility in that number. You know, we've seen the number of unemployed persons declining this year, the number of people not in the labor force, you know, no longer trying to work has increased, um, but ultimately, you know, not huge declines. When you look at the data for those that are, you know, of working years, 25 to 54, um, you know, the number of folks who are unemployed um, and, and looking for work has come down consistently still a little bit above pre-COVID levels, but definitely has declined. Um, the BLS specifically collects data on quits, you know, the number of people who have left employment um, voluntarily versus in a layoff. You know, before COVID, we were seeing an average of three to three and a half million quits every month. 
Um, so far in 2021, we're averaging about 3.7 million. So, you know, it's up a little bit, but, you know, again, not this overwhelming trend. And I think part of, you know, what, what seems to potentially be occurring here, we've had such a, a kind of interesting labor market. It was kind of tight for so long and very favorable for employers for so long that I think any sense of changes in these behaviors are really notable, but perhaps is not actually all that unusual and, and maybe as signs of a healthy workforce that people are able to retire. People are able to, you know, leave their jobs and look for something that's a better fit for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that the bumps in sort of lower wages, low, lower wage jobs has definitely started to, we haven't seen the results yet, but we're starting to anecdotally see that people are finding people once they raise their wages up. So yeah. maybe this will turn here in the, the, the coming months. Right. So uh, what role do retirement plans play in all of this? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, we always talk about attracting and retaining workers, right? So attracting workers, employers are looking to fill some of these seats that have been vacated, you know, things to consider there, you know, the number one thing employees or potential hires are always going to look at is company contributions, especially matching contributions. You know, for better or for worse, people really, you know, latch on to what the match is much more so than a profit sharing style contribution, even if it's a really generous profit sharing contribution. And then eligibility, you know, people want to know how quickly am I going to start to benefit under the plan? How quickly am I going to get those contributions? We've definitely been having conversations with clients this year, you know, looking to reduce eligibility, looking to, you know, potentially increase contributions as they're seeing some of those pressures. And have we had um, any of our clients look at um, accelerating their vesting so that um, they one. can attract those people right away so it's so they don't have to wait three or five years to get that money? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, pe clients are saying, you know, I don't want to lose out on people. I don't want to lose out on the right candidate over something like vesting. So that's been another area that we've seen some acceleration. But that's also kind of an important consideration in retaining, you know, workers. How can you use the plan to retain workers? Ultimately, you know, I always say the 401k plans are a really weak tool for retention at the end of the day. You know, something that can help a little bit in the near term if you've got a profit sharing contribution feature in your plan, if you're having a great year, potentially saying, look, you know, we're going to make a profit sharing contribution, but you got to be here at the end of the year in order to get that contribution that can keep people around a little bit longer. And then vesting, you know, again, if you've got a vesting schedule, keeping people for three, five years before they benefit from that contribution, you don't know that we have great evidence that that works, um, but if nothing else, it's a little bit of a cost control to help manage through, you know, if you are making those contributions more generous and folks are choosing to, to turn over that you're recouping some of that cost. And maybe just a uh, sort of off a tangential topic, do, do you think pension plans do a better job at that re retention than a 401k? Potentially. Um, there's not as many around anymore, so a little bit harder to say. Um, the, the vesting tends to be longer on pension plans, um, tends to be, I'll say, a more severe you know, result for someone who leaves earlier. You can kind of lose it all, I'll say, but there's just so, so many fewer of them around that, uh, you know, hard to draw too many conclusions. Got it. And I'll All say right. one other tool that, you know, is definitely powerful, especially for kind of attracting and retaining, um, you know, executive level talent are non-qualified plans. There's a lot of things you can do in a non-qualified plan on pay, on vesting that you can't do in a qualified plan that can make those really powerful tools. Absolutely. And let's move on to our deep dive on retirement income. So on our deep dive this month, we're going to talk about in-plan retirement income. And uh, Allison, give us a preview of what we're going to cover in that uh, deep dive. Yeah, for sure. You know, we spend so much time on accumulation, building account balances, um, but not as much time on decumulation. And, and candidly, I think it's because it looks so different for different people and unlike accumulation. So some of the most important things we think here, uh, as far as where we are now, where we're going, is first talking about what does decumulation look like? What does income from plans look like in for different participants? What are some of the 
barriers to in-plan income, whether it's participants, things like how their savings is structured, what plan, uh, what options the plan offers, misunderstandings and, and ease of use. Um, what are the barriers for sponsors? Things like administration, service provider capabilities, fiduciary concerns, um, and just participant interest and in, in populations. And then talking a little bit about the products, you know, what does the marketplace for these products look like today? I think we're generally in the second inning here. There's a lot of concepts out there. There's a lot of talk about products, including this recent Wall Street Journal article that implied BlackRock has newly created a product where they're putting annuities in everyone's target date funds, and that is absolutely not correct. Um, but, you know, what does the marketplace look like? What is the range of products? And what are some of the considerations that sponsors should be thinking about as they're approaching this, these questions of in-plan income and starting to hear more about products in the marketplace. Yeah, that's great. It's a, it's a great uh, deep dive. So if you are interested, check it out here. If, uh, if you have questions, certainly give us a call on that.